In the year 79 AD, the legendary Italian volcano Mount Vesuvius erupted. It buried the nearby Roman town of Pompeii. Just over a thousand bodies have been found in the partly excavated streets and houses. Visitors are still told that the victims were all crushed by a huge deluge of rock. But there is a mystery here. Few of the bodies show any sign of damage or violence. Nor did they succumb to boiling hot lava. That would have taken a week to reach them, plenty of time in which to escape. Their town is decimated, yet the bodies seem to be virtually intact. Now forensic science is rewriting history. In Pompeii, there's evidence of one of the rarest of all volcanic phenomena. The latest data completely disprove the traditional explanation. For the first time, it's possible to create the definitive hour-by-hour -hour account of that terrible day and to answer the riddle of Pompeii. Mount Vesuvius and Old Pompeii are now both engulfed by the urban sprawl of Naples. Vesuvius is still a destroyer. It's erupted over 30 times in the last 2,000 years. For centuries, lava has regularly flowed down the mountain and damage the towns beneath. Professor Harold R. Sigurdsson is the foremost authority on Vesuvius. He studied its every eruption, including the most recent, in 1944. But the new cone of Vesuvius is right behind me here. That's the active cone. It's been built up since the formation of the caldera. And that cone continues to erupt as recently as 1944, when this lava flow came down the slope from the crater and flowed down here, down into the caldera. As it accumulated there, it continued to float down towards the west, and then down uh, off the volcano into the, uh, the build-up areas, following down one of the major valleys that issues from the volcano. And there it flowed into and through the city of uh, San Sebastiano, destroying many houses and uh, causing tremendous damage. However, while it brought heartache to thousands, only 20 people actually died. It is very rare that people get killed by lava flows because simply you have a lot of time to move out of the way, but you lose your houses, lose your land, lose your fields. And so the destruction is very extensive, but the death toll is almost nil. So why was the death toll so high during Vesuvius's most famous eruption in 79 AD? It was 1,500 years before someone stumbled on the first clue.
In 1594, the architect, Domenico Fontana, supervised the digging of a tunnel through the area to divert water to this munitions factory, which is still in use. His workmen hit painted walls bearing the inscription, Pompeii. But it was only in 1748 that excavation started in earnest. Soon, workmen were pulling out treasure after treasure. The excavators were surprised at how easy it was to dig. For the volcanic material that covered the town was not rock-hard black lava, but lava smashed into billions of particles of dust and pumice. And buried in it lay the strongest clue to the mystery. In 1863, the archaeologist Giuseppe Fiorelli noticed that the skeletons of the Pompeians were usually found inside hollow cavities. He decided to pour plaster into them, and the shapes they produced were amazing. Buried under meters of volcanic material, the soft tissues of the bodies had rotted away leaving only the bones and an exact hollow impression of the corpse. People marvelled at the sleeping dead. But scientists were baffled. Of the 1,000 bodies exhumed, few had horrendous injuries. Few were trapped or crushed. It's only now, with the invention of 3D MRI scanning, that strong clues to the cause of death can be gleaned. At the University of Naples, Professor Francesco Sasso has scanned five skeletons found just outside Pompeii during recent road widening. If you look at this skull, there's an anomaly. We found in the left maxillary sinus tubes, a big plug of white powdery material. In particular, if you look closely, you can see these white particles here. It looks very like dust. It seems that the victims were exposed to extremely dusty air. But could that really have accounted for so many deaths? Harold R. Sigurdsson has tried to answer this riddle for the last 20 years. He's conducted an exhaustive study of the rock strata at many sites around Vesuvius and has just completed his calculations. We are here at the Plantes, just to the uh, southwest of the volcano. It's an imperial villa, but uh, it's also a place where we have a complete stratigraphy. All of the layers are represented here at Oplantis from the 79 eruption. Now I'm standing on the Roman soil or surface, ground level, and here's the first pumice fall represented by this layer. Sigurdsson has established that all of this material fell from the sky like rain. Could the Pompeians simply have been buried alive? To find out more, Sigurdsson first turned to the only eyewitness account of the eruption, that of writer Pliny the Younger. Pliny tells us that he, his mother and his uncle, Pliny the Elder, were 30 kilometers west of Vesuvius at the port of Mycenaeum. His uncle was the senior official in the area and commander of the Roman Navy. Pliny the Younger's account focuses on the heroic death of his uncle. But he also provides vital clues to the mystery. Crucially, he times the start of the eruption at 12 noon. On the 24th of August, 
At noon, my mother drew his attention to a cloud of unusual size and appearance. He called for his shoes and climbed up to a place which would give him the best view of the phenomenon. Its general appearance can be best expressed as being like an umbrella pine, for it rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. I imagine because it was thrust upwards by the first blast and then left unsupported as the pressure subsided. Sometimes it looked white, sometimes blotched and dirty. Pliny's description of a column of cloud stretching many kilometers above him has perplexed scientists. Could the eruption really have been this big? Sigurdsson has measured the total amount of material the volcano dropped in the area and believes that Pliny was absolutely correct. Rather than a slow lava flow, the 79 AD eruption was an event that only happens every two to five thousand years, a massive explosion of molten rock. A single volcano has many different styles of eruption, uh, as Vesuvius does. We know that Vesuvius produces lava flows, uh, signifying that, uh, the presence of uh, magma that is poor in gases. It produces very explosive eruptions, some of the most explosive on Earth, signifying that it also has magmas that are very gas-rich. Under Vesuvius is a magma chamber, an underground tank of molten rock. From the crater above, Sigurdsson has calculated it is five kilometers in diameter and three kilometers down. As it fills up, it causes earthquakes and heating of the groundwater. The rock above it eventually splits. A fissure appears and a thin column of magma makes its way to the surface. If it leaks out slowly, it results in a lava flow. But in 79 AD, the column couldn't squeeze out of the surface because of dense rock formations. Over hundreds of years, the pressure built up. If you have a break of hundreds of years, or an extensive break of no activity, magma is still coming up into the reservoir, and as it accumulates in the reservoir, that magma undergoes certain chemical changes uh, that lead to a buildup of gases in the magma. At noon, on the 24th of August, the buildup of gases cracked the volcano's cone. The trapped molten rock shot up into the air, fragmented and cooled into billions of particles of dust and pumice. High altitude winds blew it to the southeast. Within minutes, Pompeii was at the center of the deluge. But this isn't what killed the victims. The eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD was the biggest for 4,000 years. Geological data shows that it ejected 10,000 tons of material every second. Such was its power that rock flew many kilometers up into the sky and then hurtled down towards Pompeii. However, 
Professor Sigurdsson's theory is that most of the population survived the downpour because the material was too light to kill them. When the magma is moving up from great depth, it's subject to great pressure deep in the earth. All the gases are pressed into the magma, into the liquid. But when the liquid moves higher, the gases come out and they form bubbles. And the bubbles get bigger and they get more numerous. And they, they, they effervesce, if you like. And it forms a foam. The magma turns into foam. The foam is uh, filled with gas cavities that are filled with steam. And that foam is then ejected explosively and breaks up, solidifies in the, in the atmosphere. The, 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 the magma or the liquid surrounding the bubbles forms glass, volcanic glass, and what we end up with is pumice. Very lightweight material, low density, floats on water, but it is rock. It's rock full of bubbles. Indeed, Sigurdsson is able to calculate how quickly the pumice dropped. By comparing the crater size to how far pumice traveled, he can show that it fell at around 20 centimeters an hour. And according to Pliny the Younger, people were able to protect themselves. As a protection against the falling objects, they put pillows on their heads, tied down with cloth. Two writers, 2,000 years apart, show that the population of Pompeii should simply have been able to walk away. So why didn't they all leave? It seems at first, people did not know what was happening. Educated Romans certainly knew what volcanoes were. Pliny the Elder wrote about Mount Etna in Sicily and was aware of the existence of lava flows. He would also have read the engineer Vitruvius, who wrote 50 years before him. He believed Vesuvius was a volcano, but that it was dormant and therefore no cause for concern. At that time, the crater of Vesuvius was described as being draped with uh, vegetation and, uh, uh, and difficult to access. Also, we have evidence from uh, frescoes. There's a famous fresco that was found in Pompeii that shows the volcano uh, as being forested. This heavy vegetation indicates that Vesuvius hadn't erupted at all for a long time. Modern geological studies suggest for around 400 years. But while they'd never seen or heard of Vesuvius erupting, the Pompeians were no strangers to earthquakes. In 62 AD, one nearly wiped out the town. Historian Ray Lawrence has studied the houses of the town and the surrounding area of Campania. Campania is associated always with earthquakes, so there's a certain amount of, um, yes, it's Campania, so there are earthquakes. So after the AD, AD 62 earthquake, um, Seneca would tell us that somebody's mad if they want to give up coming to Pom Pompeii, for instance, because they're frightened of earthquakes. He'd say that's the wrong motive. In fact, archaeologists have found strong evidence of earthquake activity in the weeks leading up to the eruption. The Villa Castiamanti on the main shopping street was a typical large townhouse which had suffered recent damage. Before the 24th of August, AD 79, this area had suffered very badly from earthquakes and there was a need to reconstruct things. This is a house where a lot of change has happened because we're not just dealing with one house, we're dealing with a block of houses which are all interconnected. So, Different things are happening in different parts of the house. Um, it's thought that in the back, for instance, some painters had been working that morning because there's a paint pot found in the corner. And it's not just the Villa Castiamanti. 
there are patched up masonry cracks and patched up frescoes all over Pompeii. The Pompeians may not have known that imminent volcanoes also cause tremors. When the huge eruption of rain and pumice started, they must have been scared. But their experience of earthquakes told them to sit it out rather than flee. Within the structure of the eruption itself, that there's a certain amount of waiting and seeing, and then somebody comes to tell you, you're an idiot unless you leave. I mean, even people like Pliny the Younger sits down and reads some Livy, Livy's history of Rome, rather than leaving the building. And it's only when one of his uncle's friends, who's from Spain, comes to see him and says, look, why don't you leave? That's the obvious thing to do at this moment in time. The building will fall apart and you should simply go. A new mapping study by Professor De Carolis has analysed all the old excavation records. He has plotted what bodies were found where, and it confirms that people did show a degree of hesitation before leaving. What we can say is that the first natural reaction of those who had relatives or friends in the city must have been to go and look for them, as well as to go and look for the most precious objects in their homes in order to take them away. This is now scientifically confirmed as many human bodies had by them many precious objects. Therefore, whoever did, whoever managed to escape, must have thought of taking away their personal properties. We also find, and this is quite obvious, their house key. I mean, many bodies were found with the iron house key of their own homes, so those who ran away first locked their houses and then left. We know this for sure. This early hesitation was to prove fatal. Sigurdsson's calculations show that the rate at which the volcano ejected material actually increased in the first few hours. This pumice fall begins to form probably around noon. And then as you see, it's getting coarser. The coarsening of the pumice fall is due to increased intensity of the eruption. The eruption is getting more violent. There's more energy. There's a higher rate of magma. Initially, the magma was coming out at the rate of about a million kilograms per second. Uh, towards the upper part of this uh, layer, we call this the white pumice, towards the upper part of it, it was coming out about 10 million kilograms per second. So there's an increase, tenfold increase, in the rate of flow of the magma out of the volcano. This particular stage of the eruption we call the Plinian stage, in honor of the Plinies. They, the Pliny the Younger was the first one to document and observe this type of activity, and he observed an eruption column that went up to great height in the atmosphere. Actually, we've done some modeling and investigations on this particular deposit and, and the, that phase of the eruption, and we know that it started off as about a 17 kilometer high eruption column, and it went up to about 32 kilometers. In fact, the heat generated by the eruption was so great that the pumice was carried 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface, three times higher than airliners fly. With Pliny providing the start time of noon, Sigurdsson's flow rate data show that by four in the afternoon, Pompeii was smothered in a blanket of pumice nearly a metre deep. By this stage, the roofs all over the town were under unbearable pressure. Between then and the end of the day, almost all of the 20,000 people archaeologists estimate lived in the city did finally leave. But 1,044 bodies have been recovered within the city walls. Why did they, and perhaps even more, stay? New findings suggest that not everyone may have been able to flee. 
Professors Ciparolo and Cascino have been able to extract DNA from 13 skeletons found at a house in the town's main shopping street, the Casa Polibio. The results show that there were strong bonds of attachment, lovers, family. In the people from Polybia's house, there were two people with a disease, spina bifida, although we can't say if it would have affected them in any way. But there are telltale signs for why they may have stayed. One of these people was a young pregnant woman at the end of her term, very close to giving birth. And this perhaps could be the reason they decided not to flee, to stay in the house and to hope to save themselves. One decides to stay because one lover is sick and they can't flee because they want to remain together. That seems reasonable to me. These pictures show some of them in the position they were found. Two of them in particular, these two, are holding hands. This, of course, suggests a very strong family bond. We think that one of the two is a teenager, so he's probably holding his father's hand. In addition to DNA testing, Professor Sasso has found that in the group he has analysed, there was someone who may have been in too much pain to flee. Well, this subject suffered from toothache, a serious toothache in the roots, and he also suffered from an abscess of the maxillary sinus. It's one of those toothaches where half the face is swollen up and in great pain. That's one reason he may have stayed. If there were other reasons, we don't know. But he must have been somebody with a strong resistance to pain. He probably was a soldier or a gladiator. This perfectly healed wound, it's obviously a sword wound, shows he was a fighter, a tough man. Whether they were forced to stay or whether they fled, the population of Pompeii must have feared the worst. Bizarre weather could only have added to the sense of doom. All of the elements are working against you there. Continuous lightning strikes, because one of the properties of a big explosive eruption like this is that it basically short circuits the electrical conditions between the Earth and the upper atmosphere, and that produces almost continuous lightning in the, in the eruption cloud. So that would have been a, a, a frightful scene. Pliny the Elder's predicament illustrates the growing chaos. He tried to lead the Roman navy to the coast near Pompeii to evacuate refugees, but they were beaten back by huge flows of floating pumice. He eventually landed at Stabiae and took refuge with his friend Pomponianus. But soon the rescuer became a hostage, finding the door of his room blocked by the pumice fall. They debated whether to stay indoors or take their chance in the open, for the buildings were now shaking with violent shocks and seemed to be swaying to and fro as if they were torn from their foundations. Outside, on the other hand, there was the danger of falling pumice stones, even though these were light and porous. However, after comparing the risks, they chose the latter. From Pliny the Younger's account, it seems that his uncle, Pliny the Elder, made it to the relative safety of Stabiae Beach by the late evening. But by that stage, around 9 or 10 p.m., the eruption was at its most powerful. In Pompeii, the pumice was getting very deep. So let's look at the pumice that has accumulated here to a height of, or a thickness of almost two and a half meters. Of course, 
We begin here around noon on the 24th on the ground, on the Roman ground that I'm standing on. And here it was covered with big amphoras. And uh, then uh, during the early stages of the eruption, we have an accumulation of the, of the white pumice wall falling out of the sky and accumulating here gradually during the afternoon of the 24th. And uh, around uh, our late afternoon, early evening, we begin to see a change in the color of the pumice wall turning darker gray. Uh, that continues to fall up to about three or four uh, in the morning on the next day when the first surge reaches Pompeii and that is that dark band what we see on the top of this uh, excavation. With no lava flows and only a few large rocks in the deposit, scientists have naturally assumed that this never-ending cascade of pumice is what eventually overcame the victims. But astonishingly, Siergutsen's findings show this is not the case. We see the tremendous effects of that surge on the people, and we see where the people were in Pompeii. They weren't down here at ground level, they weren't walking around, they weren't being buried by the pumice fall, but rather they were walking on top of it, and we see the remains right here on, on top. Amazingly, Siergutsen's theory is that just about everyone survived the constant pumice fall by continuing to walk on top of the ever-growing carpet of rock. Their cause of death was about to arrive. When the eruption finally subsided, Pompeii was buried in four meters of pumice. Centuries later, as the excavations commenced, a pattern started to emerge. A few bodies were found deep down, indicating they died early on. They appeared to have been hit by falling masonry. But the vast majority were found much higher up, nearer the surface, indicating they died later. In fact, they were all found at exactly the same level, strongly suggesting they died at virtually the same time, and none of them had any apparent injuries. I think they died for lack of oxygen. By suffocation. By suffocation. One of them had his mouth open. It was shocking because if you look at the excavation pictures, when the skeleton was found, his mouth was wide open for lack of oxygen. Same thing with the horses. Their head was turned. They were on the floor, but their mouth was turned up. So they clearly lacked oxygen. The position of the bodies is powerful evidence. It strongly suggests that the victims died by inhaling something lethal. But what? Some of the moulds of the victims of Pompeii seems to confirm this hypothesis. Some of them are lifted up on their arms, as if craning their necks upwards towards some slightly cleaner air. We are still waiting to prove this, but they must have had some serious breathing difficulties. So what could have made the air suddenly so deadly? If breathing dust had been the cause, surely they would all have died at different times because of different lung capacities and hiding places. It is only now, after 20 years of painstaking analysis, that Siergutsen can prove what really happened. Vesuvius generated 
what is now known as a pyroclastic surge. I was very lucky to be involved in the research on a very similar eruption that took place in 1982. And that was the eruption of El Chichon volcano in, in Mexico that killed about 2,000 people. And in that eruption, uh, several surges were produced that were witnessed and uh, people were killed in those. And I, I was uh, on the scene there about two days after the eruption and was able to study those surges and they look exactly like these surges. Sigurdsson's identification of surge layers in the rock at Pompeii was the answer scientists had been waiting for. Not every volcano develops a surge. It's a complex phenomenon where the eruption can be seen like a jet engine. The power it's generating is keeping the whole column up in the air. But as the crater around the eruption starts to cave in, it interrupts the flow of power. The column briefly collapses. The result is a falling cloud that hits the ground at over 200 kilometers an hour. It spreads out over a vast area like a giant dust-filled hurricane, knocking over walls, destroying everything in its path. The mystery of the surge is that as it settles, it leaves nothing but a very thin layer of ash, which is quickly buried by further pumice fall. Over here, we go to the wall of the deposit, where we can see the other surges quite clearly. We have the fall deposit, the pumice fall deposit here, quite large pumices because we're fairly close to the volcano. And uh, the first surge forming this thin layer, followed by another stage of fallout. So the first surge represents the first collapse of the eruption column. Instead of a very high Plinian eruption column, it's produced this material. We now have a, a collapse or a fountain of, of ash and pumice coming out of the volcano, flowing down the sides and uh, creating a glowing avalanche of pumice and ash reaching this site in, in a, a few minutes. Sigurdsson has calculated that Vesuvius took 20 hours to eject all of its material. In the resulting four meter thick pumice layer, there are six surge layers. By measuring where they are, Sigurdsson is at last able to show exactly when they happened. The first was at 1 a.m. It spread west and pulverized the town of Herculaneum. At 2.15 a.m., there was a second, bigger surge. At 6.30 a.m., 18 and a half hours after the eruption had first started, an even larger third surge was generated. Luckily, it ran out of energy, just reaching the northern walls of Pompeii. <laughs> Nevertheless, it must have made the air thick with dust. At 7.30 a.m., still choking and wheezing, the inhabitants of Pompeii were overrun by surge number four. They were slain by an ash and dust filled wind that swept over them at more than 200 kilometers an hour. Not only that, it was also viciously hot. Sort of make our way gently on top of the, or into the pumice fall. We see that the surge is a, actually a very thin layer. Surge number four. It's only about five to 10 centimeters in thickness, but this surge and the subsequent surge over here are the, the deposits that contain all of the human remains or almost all of the human remains in, in Pompeii. In addition, they contain building material that was carried along in the, in the surge and that is now being preserved. Over here to my right, you see several of the bodies of the people that were suffocated in, and asphyxiated in, in the surge because of the very high heat and searing high temperatures and being choked essentially on inhaling the hot ash and dusty air. 
So this is one of these excellent sites where we can see the relationship between the volcanic processes, the generation of the hot surge, and how it affected the people, demonstrating to us clearly what was the lethal agent of the eruption here in Pompeii. It was the, the fourth surge. In fact, there is strong evidence that the pyroclastic surge was at least 100 degrees Celsius, hot enough to boil water. The temperature around the victims must have reached rather high levels. Why do I think the temperature was that high? Because we didn't find any bacteria in the soil surrounding the victims, but we found bacteria in the natural cavities of the bone remains of the victims. This means that the temperature was hot enough to boil and sterilize the soil. The victims of Pompeii had a horrible death. A thick, red-hot hurricane roared in their faces like a jet blast. It seared their skin and filled the insides of their mouths, noses and lungs with scalding dust. That is why many look like they are sleeping. They fell to the ground, struggling in vain to shield themselves from the hellish, burning wind. But as quickly as it came, the surge disappeared, leaving its victims to die of their burns, struggling to breathe. It's very humbling uh, for me to, to see this. Uh, as, as, a, as a scientist, I can, can distance myself from it to some extent. But then again, I'm reminded by the number of colleagues that I've had and friends who died in surges like this and pyroclastic flows. Um, it also uh, reminds me of uh, scenes I saw uh, when I was working in Mexico in 1982, two days after the eruption of El Chichon, where uh, 1,800 people were killed in uh, surges of this sort. And I had the unpleasant uh, uh, experience of, uh, of seeing the bodies uh, interred from that uh, event, so uh, um, it's a horrible sight. Only a handful of volcanoes every century generate an eruption column. Few of those cause pyroclastic surge clouds. Even fewer are ever captured on film. During the 1997 eruption of Montserrat, a small surge was created. Typically, it was fast, hot, and devastated everything in its path. With little warning, it killed 20 people. This is what killed the people of Pompeii. It should have been the end, but Sigurdsson has found one massive final surge, far deadlier than all the rest. At 8 a.m., it swept down the mountain, through Herculaneum, through Pompeii, and out into the countryside beyond. Many who had fled the town and thought they had escaped were caught up in Vesuvius's final deadly breath. In fact, the outer fringes reached the beach at Stabiae, where Pliny's uncle was trapped. Again, his account exactly matches Sigurdsson's geological data. The flames and smell of sulphur, which gave warning of the approaching fire, drove the others to take flight and roused him to stand up. He stood and then suddenly collapsed. I imagine because the dense fumes choked his breathing by blocking his windpipe, which was constitutionally weak and narrow and often inflamed. When daylight returned on the 26th, two days after the last day he had seen, his body was found intact and uninjured, still fully clothed and looking more like sleep than death. News of his uncle's misfortune no doubt came from sailors and slaves who had been far enough away to survive the vestigial effects of the last surge. Pliny the Younger narrowly missed being overwhelmed by the massive cloud himself. It had travelled 30 kilometres across the Bay of Naples, looking like a black tidal wave, 
and hit the headland of Mycenaeum just as it ran out of energy. People bewailed their own fate or that of their relatives, and there were some who prayed for death in their terror of dying. Many sought the aid of the gods, but still more imagined there were no gods left and that the universe was plunged into eternal darkness forevermore. The complete devastation inside Pompeii, but also the horrors found outside its walls, lead to the suspicion that many, many more of the refugees must have died while fleeing on the roads and on the beaches. The area covered by the final surge cloud is so unusually vast that only 1% of it has been excavated. In fact, no matter where the archaeologists dig, they always find bodies. To the south of Pompeii, there was the river port, and another chance to escape could be to get to the river port, take a boat and leave. There are excavations there at the end of the 19th century in the actual river port. And now that area, which we call Marigine, is again under excavation by the superintendent of Pompeii, and more than 80 bodies have been recovered. They had jewels on them, which means that they probably had already fled Pompeii or the surrounding area and had taken shelter in that area. This discovery of bodies far outside Pompeii suggests a huge death toll. Sigurdsson's prediction is that although 1,000 have been found, 10 times that died, half the population. 10,000 people failed to escape the final pyroclastic surge. So the big question is, where are all the thousands of bodies of the Pompeians? And my suspicion is that they're down south, south of the city, south outside the city walls, buried underneath the pyroclastic flows, the surges, um, in the region of the Sarno Valley, uh, the region where the Sarno River flows now. It's a region that is now uh, fairly densely inhabited. It's a region where there probably will not be a lot of archaeological excavation in the future because of uh, dense population. Uh, but uh, if we want to find out more about the fate of the Pompeians, I think that's where we should look. Not in the city, but outside. Pliny does not tell us if most Pompeians lived or died. Subsequent Roman writers make little mention of them. It is known that the Emperor Titus spent a fortune in redevelopment aid for the area. But the material that buried them and their bones tells us that they suffered one of the rarest and deadliest of all volcanic phenomena. A hot pyroclastic surge that choked and burnt them as a result of the collapse of one of the biggest eruption columns of all time. An eruption that few had a hope of surviving.